If you're joining us today for the first time, this is part 11 of a multi-part series designed to help introduce and discuss the source material for the HBO show Watchmen. If you are unfamiliar with the story, or like to start from the beginning of a story, you may want to see our episode on issue one. All right, everybody, welcome to Sam and Scott are watching Watchmen, the show where we watch the HBO show Watchmen. I'm Scott. And I am And guess what we're going to talk about today? What, um, um, uh, um, Tinker Toys? No! What? <laughs> no, we're, never, we're not going to talk about Tinker Toys today. Uh-oh. Today we're going to talk about the Arr. seminal graphic novel Watchmen. <laughs> How right, are that, you doing today, Sam? Hey, that sounds probably better than Tinker Toys at this point, you know. Well, Tinker Toys are pretty excellent. You know, they're made out of the out of the wood. Different colors for the different lengths. Sort of helps you, you know, figure out your spatial, you know, recognition. You got those donutty ones. <laughs> yeah, those donutty ones. That's, those donutty that's ones a, where you can shove eight things in them or whatever. Oh man, that was. Um, I mean, if 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 they still make those, I mean, I don't know if they do because kids are so into iPads and stuff nowadays. I don't even know if they mess with Tinker Toy. <laughs> I just a, always that's remember an old school thing. <laughs> You know how they had? They always had like the different connectors would be like ninety degrees or forty five uh-huh. degrees or whatever. There'd always be one like sort of terrible spot where you ran out of those and you had to use the universal eight slaughter, and it would just look like all bu- like all bumpy. Like ah, oh, hey, this looks like a real nice cat except for that big thing hanging off its ear up there. Like what's that thing up there? Oh, don't worry about that. It's a kitty cat. Oh man! Oh yeah, younger folks probably don't had that, didn't have that experience. But those older listeners, yeah, you guys remember that. <laughs> That's nostalgia for everybody, right there, over about the age of thirty. <laughs> All right, so yeah, like Scott said, the penultimate, the penultimate, Ooh. you know, <laughs> chapter in a seminal series. Yes, we yes. are about to get into it. But let's get a couple house cleaning things out the way. So okay, 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 okay. <laughs> Okay. So you can um find us um well first of all subscribe to us um yes. you know on um um iTunes uh Apple um I'm sorry, sorry iTunes Google Play Stitcher you know Spotify anywhere that you listen to your favorite podcast podcast we are there um find us on Facebook at Sam and Scott are watching Watchmen that's our Facebook group uh, of course go to our Nerd Cyclopedia page on Facebook is getting a really you know um a lot of good pub there and everything. Ooh yeah. <laughs> Follow us on Twitter. We got a Watchmen um at Watchmen um I'm sorry at Watchmen podcast 1. Yes. No one. T. No T. No other <laughs> no other dash. We only got the one brush stroke. Right. Um, and then we also got our regular at Nerd Cyclopedia. So d- make sure you follow us. Also follow us on Instagram. We got some posts up there. You know, we'll actually be um, posting some, you know, some really good stuff from the con and everything soon. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, we're out there. <laughs> we're every- oh, and you better be finding us, even though we know you found us at least once because you're hearing this. Exactly. Uh, so <laughs> so de- de- definitely appreciate you, um, you know, listening, your new listeners and all of us that have been listening. You know, please send us the feedback at Watchmen. At, I'm sorry. Watching Watchmen podcast. There's I'm, no I'm, podcast. No, there. no, it's no podcast. I'm, I'm, it's, I'm just getting those Tinker Toys, man. You know, <laughs> <laughs> of, mind on Tinker Toys and stuff. So, watch I, need it. A, I need an elbow. <laughs> what do you mean we don't have any? What another, do you give me an eight piece? I need ah, stick. Ah, I'll take know, the donut. <laughs> watching Watchmen at NerdCyclopedia.com. There you go. <laughs> All right, guys, and you know, as always, we look forward to hearing from you. You know, the discussion goes on in those mediums, and uh, you know, check out our website. We've been posting blog posts up there. Yeah, nerdcyclopedia.com. Uh, absolutely. Share us on YouTube, you know, and, and listen, some of your cable providers, you can actually say, Sam and Scott are watching Watchmen, search YouTube, into your remote, pop right up. Oh, so if man, you ever want to annoy no. your relatives or you just want to put something on in the background and turn the TV <laughs> off, I got something for you. Do that, and you'll be able to do that with us. Oh, man, we are on your TV, too, so we are in your faces everywhere. Watch we're us. Everywhere. And we're not shy about it either. We're very in, an in your face group. So that's watch, okay. Watch us watching Watchmen. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to watch first. Well, Sam watches it first. Then I watch it. Then you watch it. We're all going to watch it. There we go. All right. So that's <laughs> that's our you know, idiocy uh, you know, out of the way for the day. Right. And now we can get to the real work art, which is chapter 11 of the limited series Watchmen. There we go. And this is a big this is a big one. 
this is one of those, you know, this is one of those, uh, one of those chapters that would be like, you know, like the second to last episode in the season of, uh, mm-hmm. like Game of Thrones mm-hmm. or, you know, the Sopranos where all the stuff goes down, you know, this is yep. where the, the plot mm-hmm. coalesces and you get to see what you've been watching. Like you, have, you finally start to understand what you've been watching this whole time, you know? Yeah, everything's coming um, together. <clears throat> chapter 11 is called Look on My Works Ye Mighty. And it is a uh, that's a reference to the the poem Ozymandias mm-hmm. by Percy Blythe Shelley. Um, those of you who do not are not familiar with that uh, poem, get familiar with it because it's uh, good. <laughs> so do that. Uh, Ozymandias also the name of the t- the character, uh, the Watchmen character. So obviously a very simple connection there. Uh, Sam, are you familiar with the poem Ozymandias? Actually, I'm not. Oh, you're not. All right. Yeah. I mean, I'm not. So, I mean, I'm, 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 um, anticipating you <laughs> let me know a little bit about that there. Oh man. Okay. So Ozymandias is a poem by Percy Bly Shelley and it's, it's, it's basically, so, you know, without, I'm not going to read it. You should, you should read it. It's actually you okay. know, one of the best poems ever written. Okay. But uh, basically to summarize, it's essentially a, uh, a story about a traveler who said there's this huge dilapidated, um, the monument out in the desert, and it's this king, and he's you know, it's it's all busted up, and his face is all you know in the in the in the sand, and he says on these on, there's a pedestal there, and it says my name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. But the so it's this mo- this audacious monument to the power of this man, but it's in ruins, oh, and wow. the desert has reclaimed it. Hmm. Uh, so, you know, the, uh, the idea here is that, you know, humanity and humans are mortal and fragile and limited. And thus, no matter what you do, eventually mm-hmm. time will, will sort of wash over that. Yeah. Um, I mean, um, I, I guess if you want to go back millions, millions of years ago, you know, the dinosaurs roamed the earth and, um, they were here for a while. And Breaking news from the Yucatan. <laughs> <laughs> and obviously now they're not. We found their right. bones several million years later. But um, as Scott said, it, it goes to show how thing, life keeps going no matter what. Mm-hmm. The universe is going to be here no matter what. But, you know, we as humans, we've only been here for like thousands of years. That's right. So, you know, they talk about global warming and stuff happening. And, you know, not going to well, hopefully none of that crazy <laughs> but I mean, you know we're not, we're not rooting for that stuff <laughs> but we, we, we're definitely not but we are mortal we are um we 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 i guess we come from the earth and we can uh, very well go back to it and you know uh if there is a higher power you know he can start his next phase <laughs> it was dinosaurs then came us and you know maybe something else that comes after us you know? absolutely so. the next terrifying monster to walk the stuff here <laughs> So the other thing that I think is important, so so Ozymandias or Ramses the Second, which uh-huh. is uh, his, Ozymandias is his Greek name. It's what the Greeks called him. Mm-hmm. Uh, was a conqueror, right? Right. So these empires, these monuments built by these conquerors, are what is crumbling into dust and moving into oblivion. Right. So there's a temporariness to this that is that is also the other the other kind of meaning of that of that poem, right? Okay. <clears throat> and for someone like uh, Adrian. Right, Ozymandias or someone like that, mm-hmm. that is the the riddle to unwrap. That's his ultimate puzzle. Okay. Right? So and that's something that we'll get into as we you know, his uh, his speech, which isn't as bad as for instance John Galt's speech in Atlas Shrugged, which is like thirty pages long and nobody's ever actually read the whole thing because it's just reductionist <laughs> uh, and very redundant. Mm-hmm. Uh, I definitely skipped most of it because I got the point. <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> so the challenge for that Adrian accepts here is how do you build something permanent when force and conquest do not work? Okay. And to Sam's point, you were talking about the extinction of uh, humanity. That's, that's the sort of Damocles, which is another Greek, a Greek allu- allusion to Greek mythology. Sorry. So that's the sort of Damocles that, that, that hangs over everybody in, in, in this universe, right? Mm-hmm. That impending nuclear confrontation mm-hmm. that's escalating, 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 escalating. And so Ozymandias has that dual, a dual meaning, right? Right. So first it's there's impermanence and what do you do to solve impermanence? And second it's, well, conquest and, and warfare don't work. 
And we see this because, I mean, the, the proof's in the pudding on that, right? I mean, you know. Right. Uh, conquest is not permanent. Uh, Alexander the Great himself is an excellent example of this, as he basically did a whole run of conquest for about 15 years and then mm-hmm. died within six months after coming back home to start ruling. Uh, you know, so that's... Uh, or Alexander the Adventurer, as Adrian would call him, right? Okay, well, well anyway, right. those are some general comments. <laughs> what, I mean, it brings the irony of, a, um, okay, so you got this guy who um, is is basically looking, you know, all of humanity and his, <laughs> is, um, what, what, what's the word you want to call someone who um, just thinks so much of himself that he thinks he's the savior? Oh, he, narcissist. <laughs> he's narcissistic He's enough. definitely a narcissist. <laughs> That, that's that for thinks, sure that, that, like 100 percent. that thinks he's he's the um one who can do this and he's immortal he's so not, so let's mm-hmm. let's let's stop for a second then because that's <laughs> definitely a batman tendency right oh yeah thinking that you can fix everything so let's talk about adrian for a minute here that's a general uh, like we, a superheroes period you know i know right this sort of savior complex right and i mean and, and we know it we know because we've all seen for instance man of steel and all the you know uh, Zach Zack Snyder's uh, reliance on the Christ imagery, <laughs> rather ah. explicitly, Zack. <laughs> Batman doesn't run people's faces over Zack. Ah. Not even on purpose. In fact, in Batman sixty six, the TV series, <laughs> Chief McGillicuddy explicitly states that unless it's in an emergency, Batman's a very conscientious and safe driver. Zack. <sighs> Uh, he didn't so do anyway, his research anyway. No, he should have done his research and not have Batman run over a dude's face. Ugh. If you want to hear more about our thoughts on that, check out the Nerdendum <laughs> episode for, for Batman versus Superman. But we digress. Uh, yeah, anyway, that's, a cross, that's called cross-promotion, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. It's what keeps things fresh uh, and, and helps synergy. <laughs> and it keeps the bills synergy. paid, too. <laughs> exactly, it does. So Adrian has some Batman tendencies, right? Yeah. Uh, he has a couple th- a couple similarities with Batman, uh, which is what we call Batman tendencies. Uh, we call- say that because all of these characters are the Batman type, other than Doctor Manhattan. They don't have powers, right? So they all have the little you know. Batman is an archetypal non powered character, so we say he has Batman tendencies. It's a, a short way of inserting these guys into the mythology. So so Adrian has Batman tendencies, and I, I mean, there's a lot of them. Obviously, the Savior complex has got to be number one, right? Yeah. Uh, that's that's enormous. Uh, two, of course, large S. Wealth and for Adrian, and this is something we find here uh, in the chapter. We discover Adrian um, did inherit a bunch of money in mm-hmm. about 1956, mm-hmm. and he gave it all away. Mm. So he said, "I want to start from nothing." Mm-hmm. So that's another Batman tendency right there. Mm-hmm. But Adrian, so so Adrian, of course, is not. You know, these are all broken toy versions <laughs> of Batman, right? Right. Uh, Batman had lines he wouldn't cross up until the recent movies. <laughs> and <laughs> let's, let's not let's not count that as a canon, you know. So okay, um, okay. So, so Batman has some lines he don't he won't cross. He right. certainly did in 1985. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Adrian will cross them yeah. because he sees the coming um, nuclear apocalypse as inevitable. And he says, and this is so neat. He credits the a comedian for showing that to him, right? Right. And he says, all great comedians make you think, which is such a you know. It's so crazy. I will, we'll get more into their relationship, but he basically seizes upon this right. and thinks laterally like Alexander the Great did with the Gordian Knot mm-hmm. and says, how do we solve this problem? How do we solve this problem outside of the systems that exist, right? Mm-hmm. And that's something Batman would do. Batman would say, we need to, this is the linchpin. We need, if we remove this piece, the whole system will fall apart, right? That's what Batman's real good at, too. Right. Mm-hmm. So the world traveling, the savior complex, obviously the theme decor, Mm -hmm. uh, that is definitely a Batman tendency as we discussed with old Danny D Mm -hmm. uh, a couple weeks ago. And so, so Adrian, what is Adrian driven by? Like we talk about what some of these guys are driven by. What draw, what do you think drives Adrian Veet? I mean, he, he to be, to be a savior. I mean, you know, he, he, he has that complex. I mean, Mm -hmm. um, he 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 want he's trying to represent something good, you know. I guess in mm-hmm. effect, because he's not a a, a a villain. He's not painted as the villain, you know. Um, he was part of a superhero group. He but he's he's so full of himself that he thinks that he knows exactly what whom humanity needs. While the mm-hmm. rest of these adventurers, you know, are um they 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 have their um they 
they they want to save like the um you know the common man and everything you know the mm. um the, you know the regular person they're not about trying to be world saviors or what have you so um adrian what is he driven by um himself <laughs> <laughs> so you see him as, as as motivated by his narcissism yeah you feel that that motivates his savior complex and what he wants is not not a, not maybe even the credit but he wants to sort of surpass like he's it's almost like he's fighting like his you know what i mean they say in baseball you're always playing against ghosts right right you know they always say that because you're playing against the guys from the, the previous eras but Adri- so adrian almost sees himself as the new iteration of alexander or you know or these great conquerors right mm-hmm. but he sees he sees that warfare you know warfare as a frontier that we're, we've reached as far as we can go with it right, right. i mean conquest right. can only go so far and as he describes here you know, uh, there's no such. Once you've reached nuclear proliferation and everybody can end the world, I mean, conquest has essentially reached obsolescence. Right. It's no so, longer a viable form of of, of uh, conflict resolution. Right. And you got the one quote unquote god in the story of Doctor Manhattan who has one. You know, he actually has superpowers. So you know, mm-hmm. he's he's all powerful. But Adrian, on the other way, on the other hand, he's the smartest man in the world. So. Um, but he fashions himself as is a, a a god. You know, he doesn't have superpowers, but he's the one that um could potentially save humanity. With um, you know, as we as as we you know go as we'll start going through the chapter. You know, he has a plan. He does. He has a really great plan, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, it's something that he thinks will work. And it's a practical <laughs> joke, which is. <laughs> uh, such rich irony is what he calls it. Okay, so let's go. Let's go ahead and get in here. So the the um, the uh, cover of chapter eleven is essentially that slash that drip the drip the blood dripping from the very beginning of the story. We see that essentially as water dripping to wipe away snow on a uh, sort of what they what is he called a vivarium, which is just a big greenhouse, uh-huh. with a bunch of stuff in it. And so we see Adrian is kind of talking about his uh, you know his general. What he's doing with all those screens, right? He kind of describes it. Right. He's sort of trying to see the undercurrent of history here so that he can figure out what's going on. And he has the capacity to do this processing. Um, he is talking to Bubastis a little bit because, uh, you know, Night Owl and Rorschach are there. He says, uh, you know, these guys are on slippery ice. I hope they don't overstep themselves and know where to stop. But we both know Rorschach doesn't know where to stop because there is no compromise for Rorschach. No compromise, uh, never. These guys probably are not going to know where to stop. <laughs> <laughs> like, or at least one of them. <laughs> yeah, one of them, and he ain't going to let the other one stop either. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, so these guys, so Rorschach and Night Owl are approaching. Um, you know, they are uh, essentially saying, you know, Rorschach says that Adrian's essentially lost his mind because he's trying to push World War Three while he eats a sugar cube. And Dan's kind of kind of coming to, to grips with what all this means. Because he he feels that Adrian has never killed anybody. He's this conscientious guy. And then uh, what's Rorschach points out that Hitler was a vegetarian or something. He's just like <laughs> like so like practical. Yeah, he's practical. He's like um so so Dan is like you know he never killed anybody. Why would he want to destroy the world? Right. <laughs> and, and Rorschach's response, ironically, <laughs> insanity. <laughs> Perhaps. Oh man, you know the uh, 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 a crazy person addressing um to trying to diagnose a crazy person, you know, is is a joke. Yeah, you know, so <laughs> so these guys are still coming. We see that Adrian has some cameras out there. He sees their approach on the TV. He tells Bubasta, so well, you know, they'll be here in a little bit. Time to deal with what we need to deal with. And so Bubasta won't go into the secret chamber. Adrian goes into. He walks in. Pushes a button. We see it's eleven twenty-five p.m. when he does that, mm-hmm. and then he walks out, and he says, "Hey, my assistants, come join me for a, a drink in the old greenhouse to celebrate." Uh, the scene cuts here. Yep. So that's the first. So that's that's what that's how we're treated. So so we Adrian's done something. Uh, he's pressed a button and done something. It's blue, sort of a blue flash. Is what yes. we see. Mm-hmm. The red light. Okay. Uh, so now we're sort of, now we're back at the newsstand. All right. And so, uh, Gus complaining about the concert, uh, over at the, uh, Madison Square Garden doesn't care for the music. 
And then uh, we kind of get intercut him complaining about the patrons of the concert with the Black Freighter. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Black Freighter sailor sort of hitches his horse at his own house. And he goes in and finds pirates in his home. And so he starts beating on the pirate. And then he realizes uh, as he's beating on the pirate in his house that uh, he's beating on his wife. Uh, he realizes he sort of hallucinated all this stuff, right? Everything's yeah, fine every, in their home. Right, right, right. And he's now be, been the impetus for bringing violence to them. Mm-hmm. And then he runs away in the night in terror, leaving the the corpse of that lady just tied to the horse outside his front house. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, that's not not a great look. Uh, <laughs> leaving Probably your house not. That way. You know. No, not a great look there. Um <laughs> Right, so then Gus says, uh, Gus is like, oh man, you know, so Gus is talking to uh, Joey's ex-girlfriend, right? Right. Um, so uh, Joey's ex-girlfriend says, hey, I'm looking for Joey. Uh, that's the cab driver. Right. And then we cut back to the vivarium, where Mr. Veet is uh, sharing his drink with his assistants. He's, and then he gives a, a speech here where he says, consider how neat this is that we're separating two universes. Um, he says, you know, today we're going to have, you know, we reached the pinnacle of a dream. And then he tell, tells his story here. So this is sort of his, I don't know, you want to call it his Philippic apology. This is sort of his story of who he is. So he's Adrian. He was born in 1939, right in America after his parents arrived. Mm-hmm. And he was so smart that he started getting extra attention and arousing suspicion in school, so he just got average grades after that. He didn't. He sort of dumbed himself down so he wouldn't attract attention. <laughs> then his parents died, and he had enough money to do whatever he wanted all the time, and he just chose not to. Right. So he gave the money back and traveled the earth because he felt like he was so superior to everybody that the only people with whom he had kinship was essentially Alexander the Great. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, so he styles his whole look after Alexander the Great, and he decides to adventure. So he follows Alexander's footsteps through his conquests in Turkey, and then, uh, well, that continues. Mm-hmm. Um, well, we cut back over to the cab. We find out that Joey works for a cab company called the Prometheus Cab Company. Aha. Uh-huh. Which is another allusion to Greek mythology to go along with the Gordian Knot Lock Company, to go along with Pyramid Deliveries, to go along with Ozymandias, Karnak. These are all tied into, I mean, I think that's, Adrian owns that, that cab the, company for yeah, sure. Yeah, things right? tied all, all, all coming together. Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, so Joey's having a, uh, an angry argument with her ex-girlfriend. Um, he says that, uh, she says, at least I'm not working in a magazine office with a bunch of guppies, which I guess means gay urban professionals. <laughs> that's what they got. <laughs> yeah. That's what they got in there. And then we see the Gordian Lock, the Gordian Not Lock Company dude shows up and says the manager of the uh, taxi company is his brother. Mm-hmm. So all these different little threads are intersecting. And, I, and obviously, I were to know that Adrian's got his fingers in all these pies, right? These are all his companies, right. which we know because he owns Pyramid. So this is all stuff we're supposed to know from context. Right. And then uh, Joey and her uh, ex-girlfriend have a conversation saying this relationship isn't going to work. Uh, Joey says, you know, you, you never slept with me, essentially. Uh, and uh, she tears up the relationship book called Knots. <laughs> so the kid... Uh, so. So jo- Josephine yells, I want to be dead here. And then the kid starts, continues reading the Black Freighter. Basically, the Black Freighter dude has escaped off to shore because he's, uh, and he can hear kind of what he calls, what does he call it? A, uh, he, basically, there's a, there's a mob coming for him. Right. Uh, and he runs back to where his raft came. We then go back to Adrian. So now Adrian is also on a journey of discovery. He follows Alexander's footsteps along the Black Sea to Egypt, follows them to... Uh, to India, and then instead of going home and dying of an infection, which he felt would be counterproductive, I suppose, uh, Adrian goes on to um, Tibet and to uh, you know to uh, the Himalayan mountains, mm-hmm. gains wis- wisdom there, and then goes back to Alexandria. Okay, and then before he came home to America, he ate a ball of hashish, <laughs> <laughs> so he got super high, went out in the desert, and. Um, Realized that Alexander the Great was only was not the perfect form of what he's looking for because he had merely resurrected right. the ancient Egyptian culture, which is which is 
the truth for him. And we know Adrian's been telling people, did you know that Pharaoh saw death as a journey? <laughs> He's been saying that to people really creepily the whole time we've been still following him. <laughs> uh, so he says, you know, these pharaohs were, were where it was at, and they're, they entrusted their secrets to their servants who were buried with them. And he says, coming home, I donned Ramsey's Greek name and began to teach, uh, to apply antiquity's teachings to the world. And then we notice that his assistant has a butterfly landing on his face. Mm -hmm. And he says, do you comprehend the triumph to which you have contributed, the secret glory that it affords? And he says, do you understand my shame at so inadequate a reward? And it's because he's poisoned his three assistants. They're all dead. They're all dead. So he walks calmly over to his control mechanism for his greenhouse, and he opens it up. And the snow comes cascading and covering over everything. Just like like a certain... Certain poem we talked about already. Yep, yep. Great visual imagery by um, Dave. For those of you reading this in a kind of college 110, that's <laughs> something that probably will be uh, a good essay question or a good essay answer for you to show come up with for the final. Since you're definitely not reading this, you're just following along with us. And <laughs> you're definitely welcome to do that. We like having you on. We like having people like you along for the ride. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs> All right, so... That cut. That, do you see that the, the panel cut between page twelve and thirteen there, Sam? Where, where yeah. you see the dude with the the you know the assistant with the ice all the way over his face, and then we cut to the moneylender's face and the bobbin in the surf, right in the um in the ocean. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the uh, the uh, the black freighter guy says the lynch mob's coming for me, and they're coming step by step. And he, then he sees the black freighter. And he realizes what he's meant to do is swim out to the black freighter. So he starts that. Meanwhile, uh, uh, the doctor's wife shows up, right? Gloria. Is her Gloria name Gloria? I can't remember if her name is Gloria. Uh, but, but she shows up and she asks Gus, like, hey, have you seen my husband? And Gus sort of says, oh, that black guy down the street sells watches. Is what he, <laughs> maybe he knows him. He's like, you think we all know each other? Like, there's a club? <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, notice also, too, you know, the storylines, the spare storylines are actually coming together, converging to this newsstand. Mm-hmm. So, yes. you know, um, with the couple, the um, the Gordian knot, the um, knot tops, and now, you know, Gloria, um, you know, mm-hmm. the um, uh, Malcolm Long's wife, you know, is, is coming yes. to oh, newsstand. Yes, oh, man. <laughs> You could have jumped in on that. You didn't have to let me thrash around in the surf on that one, boss. It's all good. <laughs> Listen, that's 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 crosstalk. I'm gonna take it. We take that out. Okay. I couldn't remember his name though. I was over here. I was struggling. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. So she sees her husband. So yeah, everything's converging here. So the man is swimming back to his uh, to his ship. Uh, everybody's here. So Josephine's here. The dude from the Gordian Lot, not Law Company's here. The, you know, the doctor and his wife are here. Everybody's here. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, they're all converging right there. Then we cut to Rorschach's POV following Night Owl in. Night Owl says, I think we found an entrance, but they're in the, you know, they're in the greenhouse that's all snowed over. Right. Uh, so it's already that full of snow and ice and Rorschach says these palm trees don't make any sense out here. There's a dead butterfly. And then Night Owl burns through the lock so they can go in and, and, uh, approach Adrian. And he Mm -hmm. says, you know, this must be how ordinary people feel. This is, must be how ordinary people feel around us. So he's acknowledging that uh, Adrian's on a different level from him. Yeah, larger and larger. And an Im- image of a um of that um Alexander the Great painting, you know, just mm-hmm. keeps coming. You know, we, this is the third time we just it. The second time this chapter, you know, right. that we, that we've seen it. So um, the cleaving of the Gordian knot. Mm-hmm. What they call lateral thinking, the ability to sort of move beyond. beyond limitations we talked about this a little bit too when we talked about chapter six we talked about rorschach sort of using similar lateral thinking and solving his bullying problem Mm -hmm. right uh we talked about how rorschach won that fight with that bully and every fight that bully would ever try to have with him forever he just said decided to win the next 30 of them all at once and that's sort (laughs) of like that's lateral thinking that's what alexander did right so uh, this is the TV room. They're all lo- so uh, Night Owl and Rorschach are looking for Adrian, and they come upon him finishing his dinner. Well, 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 well uh, but back up a little bit. I just want to yeah, comment yeah. on a couple of things. <laughs> the, what, what, how um, Night Owl and Rorschach is interacting. You know, um, Night Owl Dan is basically just trying to. He he just can't believe anything. All this is happening. Um, that 
that Adrian is the, you know, the culprit in a lot of this craziness going on. But, you know, he's just trying to um, rationalize the fact, you know, he's a conscientious guy. He's a pacifist. He's a vegetarian. And then here comes um, Rorschach. Well, Hitler was a vegetarian. If that bothers you, <laughs> if that bothers you, Dan, um, leave it. <laughs> leave me, me to me. <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> I'll take care of it. Or so you know? just like rolling his eyes. He's like, do you know the magnitude of this? Like, do you know the magnitude <laughs> of trying to start World War Three? Like, can you comprehend like, like what I'm like? What the ret- retribution is deserved? Exactly. Demanded by you this. Know, um, Rorschach sees a crime happening. Mm-hmm. His motto is never compromise. Not even in the face of Armageddon. Right. So his 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 realm of thinking versus um, Night Owls. Is, is is straightforward his focus is is non you know there's no there's no gray area in his way of thinking so as scott said they they come upon adrian he was eating dinner and he's got a big shiny bowl and he sees rorschach's reflection mm-hmm. rorschach rushes him and, and you know this this little action sequence where he just completely clowns rorschach and night out right i mean it's just there's mm-hmm. no there's no question about it he doesn't even break a sweat and just smashes them. Reminds me of, you know, I, I guess I was watching a little bit of uh, Robert Downey Sherlock Holmes recently. Okay. Where he does that thing where he says how the fight's going to go, and then they kind of show it. And that, that's kind of how I would want this to be portrayed, right? Where Ozymandias has it all worked out in advance and then says manners. <laughs> he says manners and sticks but, them to the but table. But it also the goes to show with the further deconstruction of how superheroes, how, how the normal tropes of, okay, you enter. Um, so Adrian is now the villain at this point. You know, right. um, superheroes normally in a trope, you know, situation announce themselves. They start, you know, exp- you know, doing exposition stuff, you know, and themselves in a room start going over, you know, you did this, you did that. And, you know, how dare you? Blah, blah, blah. There's no words in these scenes. Rorschach just straight goes at um, Adrian. You know, you know, Adrian sees its reflection in the, um, you know, in the in the in the in the bowl and everything and takes out Rorschach. But mm-hmm. the point is just Rorschach doesn't, uh, or, nor Dan, um, says nothing, you know, to Adrian, you know, um, and just straight go at him. And then, like, um, Ror, um, Adrian's whole thing is manners. <laughs> Normally in a, in a situation, you know, you would announce yourself. But Rorschach obviously does not do that. Well, they say basically Adrian's too dangerous for them to sort of talk to. Right. They say we got to subdue him first and then deal with it. Mm-hmm. So that's what he's trying to do here. But Adrian sees him and is so fast that he's able to stick Rorschach's jacket to the table with a fork. And then he's faster. He's like faster than a laser beam. Oh, man. Right? Because Night Owl's like trying to zap him with his laser. And it doesn't work. You know, he hits this. He hits the the serving tray and then Adrian knocks him out, smacks him in the head with a, the with a tray and then smashes his little laser pen that I'm guessing is, you know, very like an very, actual real laser. A very Batman-like. Yeah, it's a very Batman gadgety sort of thing. Pull out of his utility belt, right? Well, no, the Batman um, swiftness that Adrian. Um, oh, you're talking about that too. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, in order to take them out and everything, you know, Batman, as he's written, <laughs> is able to just take out criminals just like that. You know, right? He's so far beyond them that he doesn't kill anyone, right. Zach. That's how good <laughs> he is. <clears throat> but I digress. Mm-hmm. We digress again. We've, we've heard some recent comments from someone we disagree with on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. Um, and they don't know we exist. That's okay. It's All not right. a big deal. No. So, uh, so then Adrian, so Adrian completely just disarms them and stops, like just, just dominates them. And then he pours himself a glass of water and says, now what can I do for you? <laughs> <laughs> like you and then it's like, you know damn well what you could do for us. He says, what are you trying to do, start World War III? And uh, so Adrian sort of says, I'm, I'm trying to improve the world. <laughs> That's what he says. And he sort of tells, he tells them his story, and uh, it's pretty straightforward. So first he tries to go after the crime syndicates, but realizes that's sort of not going to be an operative end of the solution. Mm-hmm. Then he meets the comedian. And the comedian, he sort of, the comedian gets his attention. Mm-hmm. Although he says the comedian has a skillful feint, but a little, an uppercut and not much else. But he says the comedian wins, right? Right. He says the comedian kind of took him. Uh, then he meets Dr. Manhattan in 1960, and then JFK gets assassinated. So he kind of realizes that, you know, uh, they're not going to, you know, there's a sort of inevitability to all these crisis lines, right? Yeah. 
in a, in an intercut with Rorschach is still coming at Adrian. <laughs> yeah, he's still trying to get him with <laughs> the still fork. To, with the fork, but Adrian, <laughs> his depth as he is, he, you know, fends him off. <laughs> he fends him off sort of flawlessly, messes with his like pulls his mask like over to the side. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and then tells them, "Well, you remember the Crime Busters meeting?" He says, "I'm sure you remember." He said, I, "He teased me and said I could be the smartest guy on the cinder." But he realized the comedian was right. Uh What's he say there? He says that's when it tipped me. You know, uh, Nelson. Um, he said Nelson's voice was whiny, and then he goes outside and he says he swore to deny their last black laugh at the Earth's expense to the comedian. Right. So this is all a rejection of the comedian's statement that nuclear war was an inevitability, and there was nothing that could be done to stop it. He's he right. sort of is vowing like, no, you're not going to be right about this. This is this is sort of like his birth, whereas Rorschach, you know, was still, you know, a regular Edward, you know, Walter Kovacs putting on a um, mask and everything and doing a superhero. This is this meeting was an integral meeting with these with these crime busters. Um, mm. And it changed the way they saw themselves, um, you know, fighting, fighting future crime. Ozymandias took it to the very extreme. And this was sort of like his birth into. Mm. Um, you know, into his, into how he was gonna um pre, you know prevent this nuclear war. You know, um to just save the world. He said, okay, instead of doing all this little stuff and everything, I'm gonna think about this in a bigger picture type thing. You know, mm-hmm. and um this is when he understood. Well, think about the parallel <laughs> for him. This realization, mm-hmm. right? This refocus, this change of him. Mm-hmm. from the, you know, the adventure, the Alexander the Adventure into something more calculating mm-hmm. and more effective. Mm-hmm. It's actually a pretty decent parallel to what happens to Rorschach in 1975. Mm-hmm. So Rorschach's career is a little slower than Ozymandias's, but he realizes that the means he was using to address the problems he's trying to address were insufficient. Mundane. Mundane, yes. Mm-hmm. So he, he stops allowing criminals to live, right? That's what Rorschach does in 75. Right. So that refocus of will, okay, right. that is what is a, echoed here in Adrian. Yes. So yes. it's the same sort of thing. So at that point, he decides that there is now, well, basically now there are, are goals in, to which there cannot be means that are too far. Like yes. the ends will not justify the means, and they have to. Right. So that's a realization for both. Ironically, they both had the same, you know, um, mm-hmm. you know, motivations and everything. Just go about it two different ways, you know. If you want to think about it like that, um, um, Adrian's is a, is a bigger picture. Um, right. Rorschach's is is small, maybe way too small, but right. they had the same motivations. Well, for Rorschach, you know, Rorschach's motivations <laughs> to to be a crime fighter are all very personal to him. Mm-hmm. You know, we you know we he's he's this guy who's feels like he got a short stick, you know, mm-hmm. short end of the stick with parenting and, you know, feels like, you know, he's he's sort of living in this underworld of filth that's always around him. But Adrian doesn't feel these things emotionally. He's calculating. So he sees these as issues that need to be addressed and how are we going to address them? And he's saying, I'm willing to address them using anything at my disposal. I am willing to cut the knot with my sword. Right. right. That's lateral thinking, and that's solving the problem without worrying about the effects of solving the problem. Right. Because sometimes you got to break a few eggs to make an omelet, right? Yep. <laughs> that's what I've heard. Uh, so uh, now we move back from this conflict where Adrian's just walking away from these guys, and they're pretty much like, you know, my goodness. <laughs> mm-hmm. <Right. laughs> They've just been trashed by the – like he's just like not even concerned <laughs> enough to walk, like face us, right? Right. Uh, so then, uh, Gloria and Malcolm have a conversation like, look, you got to give up trying to help people. This world's too messed up. Meanwhile, uh, you know, uh, Josephine and her girlfriend have a fight and, you know, Malcolm says, I'm going to try to break that up. Well, Gloria is like, you can't keep trying to save everybody in the world. Right. Um, and he says, I can't run from it. He feels compelled to help people. Very similar to how these masks, the masked adventurers feel compelled to help people. Right. Exactly. I ring. Mm hmm. So. Uh, we are treated to kind of the end of the, the little bit of the end of the black uh, black freighter here. He's the uh, sailor is still swimming out to the black freighter. Okay, mm-hmm. and then we move right back to Adrian, who's continuing to to discuss his plan. So for the first time, I genuinely understood that Earth might die. I recognize the fragility of our world in increasingly hazardous times, and yet what could I do? 
My first step was to stand back as far as I could to view the problem from a fresh perspective, my vista widening with my comprehension. So what he's saying here is that he had to take a step back and look at this problem as sort of on a different time scale. Yeah, so the, the difference, yeah, the difference between the morality of human life and the morality of uh, existential species ending, you know, mm-hmm. threats, right? So there's a difference in scale there. And so he basically says, listen, I'm going to, I, I started preparing right away. So I began to amass a fortune and he took those proceeds. So basically he says, first I got the pattern for the spark hydrants. Then he developed the dimensional developments with the proceeds, right? So that he could start looking at uh, teleportation and those other sort of advanced Dr. Manhattan style technologies. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, the ends would have to justify the means because the end of the world does not, does the concept no justice, right? The everything of history, right. the earth, humanity, all we've ever known disappearing and does no one any good. And so essentially, unless something changed with it, but by the nineties, things would be, it would reach a crisis point. That's what he says here. And, uh, he says, except for Richard Nixon, <laughs> whose name's on a plaque on the moon. It would be I mean, no, no one will ever no, know no, anybody. No, no, yeah, no human vestige would ever remain. So, right, know. right, right. And then now we get to the end of the Black Freighter. So the sailor grabs the rope, and as he climbs up, a cheer goes out. A stench. A cheer with a stench of fronting heaven. Uh, so he was, you know, they were coming to claim him because he was evil, right? That's kind of what it is. It's right. his damnation. Um, so we see the, the, uh, Josephine and her ex-girlfriend having a fight in the background. Uh, Gus and the kid find out their both their names are Bernard. He says, how about that? And he says, ah, I don't mean nothing. Little, little bird, he says, ah, it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> and the cops pull over to stop a fight. They basically say the same thing Malcolm does, which is you got to try to f- fix something. And then the guy selling watches is trying to get out of here. And then there's cops down the street. We see the Gordian knock guy and the dude from the Pyramid Company, you know, from the, uh, I'm sorry, from uh, Prometheus Cab Company talking to each other. Mm-hmm. And all the ancillary characters are converging on this newsstand and that, or that's that street. Right. So they're all right there, right they're all there. Right there. Yes. Then Adrian continues to explain his plan. He synchronized everything. And meanwhile, te- technology and teleportation, he couldn't teleport anything because it would just die. Uh, but it was possible. So he said, I quit a couple of years before the Keen Act to make sure that um, I could concentrate on my plan. Okay, because he could, you can't, and I, he says, you cannot unite the world by conquest. Alexander's method, I would use a trick. I would frighten it towards salvation with the history's greatest practical joke. And that's what upset the comedian so much. <laughs> because it was going to use a joke to to basically undo an affront to everything the comedian does, make him extinct as a fighting man. The perfect fighting man is what he calls him. Right. And we're intercut here with scenes of the murderer kicking the comedian's door and beating him up that we remember from the first issue. Mm-hmm. He says an end to fighting, and we mean to know that that's a broad term because we see the the large panel at the bottom here is uh, Josephine and Eric's girlfriend fighting, doctor intervening. We see Gus in the background there. And what's that behind Gus? It says, oh, yeah, the Institute for Extraspatial Studies in the background. So all these Adrian plots are all here. They're all right here in this all one right place. There. Yep. Converging. And he says, how could genetics have put an end to war? Uh, John says that. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, Dan, Dan says that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. And he says, well, J- John proved that, you know, we could do teleportation, but these things would die right away. And then Eddie was driving back and saw this big ship and this this basically stumbled upon Adrian's secret island that he bought in 1970 and realizes that it's all these artists and everyone scientists working on some sort of new life form. Uh, and then he learned what what Adrian was going to do and he just couldn't couldn't handle it anymore. This was a step too far, like we said. It was a sick joke that was going to be you know make him render him obsolete and solve the problem. But at the same, so he couldn't stop it because he knew that it would be good. Right. Uh, but at the same time, he was terrified by its portents, what it, what it meant that we would, you know, Adrian's plan would be, uh, be coming to fruition. He right. said, Adrian says, Blake understood. He knew that my plan would succeed, though its scale terrified him. That's why he told nobody. It was too big to discuss, but he understood. Uh-huh. Uh, he understood the portents knew a dazzling transformation was at hand for mankind. So we see even Gunga Diner, right? I I had my suspicions about Gunga Diner being another thing Adrian owns because he went to India. Right. And Alexander fought the elephant. So that's a I think these are all things he owns, right? They're all in right. one's place. And he's sort of been behind in the background keeping tabs on all these people. And he says that he recorded his conversation and he that's why he had to kill Blake. Because he knew Blake was cracking. 
Right. So he had to. That's a big loose end. He had to um tie up. So. Mm-hmm. And boy, did he. Yeah, oh yeah. So after seeing what he does to Rorschach and Dan, it's no surprise that he was able to easily overcome the comedian, right? I mean, that's not a shocker. Um, so he, he killed the comedian. And then he hired his own killer to throw everyone off the chase because Rorschach's mass killer three had gotten so much me- momentum. And then he said, uh, Dan says, it's crazy who's going to believe an alien invasion. He says, I'm going to trick them into thinking we're being attacked by aliens. And he says, look... Uh, and then uh, Rorschach says, you said tele- teleportation wouldn't work. Uh, and then he says, well, it works fine, assuming you want the thing to explode on its arrival. And he says, teleported to New York, my creature's death would trigger a mechanism within its massive brain cloned from a human sensitive, the resultant psychic shockwave killing half the city. And I love Dan's reaction. <laughs> you need help. Dan, he's he like, oh, yeah, come, on, come on, Zach, this, this is just ridiculous. You, you, I, I know this half of New York stuff is just some bullshit, but I'm glad we got here. We still got here before you got deeper into this madness. Thank this, goodness. This, oh, thank goodness. Oh, Oof, we made it in time to talk you out of this and <laughs> oh, stop you. Oof. He says, when were you going to do this? <laughs> and then he says, do it. This speech is so great. This is like, he says, do it. Dan, I'm not a Republic serial villain. Do you seriously think I'd explain my masterstroke if there remains even the slightest chance of you affecting the outcome? I did it 35 minutes ago. Oh, man. If you want to mic drop a comic book um, speech in, 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 a, in a graphic novel and everything, this was a, blo- a moment when I first read it just blew my mind. And because, look at the reaction. Because, because before this, like I said, in the district construction, you got these tropes, you got these things that regularly happen with um, heroes and villains that, okay, you norm- you know how this is going to normally end and everything. The, the the bad guy gives a speech, bam, you know, that's the mm-hmm. expectation. He, ah, you caught me. He did this 35 minutes ago, guys. So when he was pressing that button at 1125, mm-hmm. that's what he did. <laughs> You teleported that psychic thing over to New York. And we see then the next panel, the stunned, silent reactions of Dan and, and Rorschach. Rorschach. Mm-hmm. Uh, we see it is now midnight in New York. So this happened yep. at 1125 when he hit the button. Mm-hmm. So the yeah. timelines we're watching are non-synchronous. This yep. is all happening 35 minutes ago. The and last page is essentially the look on everybody's face when mm-hmm. the teleportation happens and that creature explodes. So, 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 so you got the reactions, you got everybody converging on this fight that's happening, you know, the police, the, the newsstand guy, the, the, the black guy that was reading a comic book and everything, the, the, the not tops. And like Scott said, you know, everybody in the final panel on page 28 turns. Mm -hmm. Oh, this was heartbreaking, 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 because these were ancillary characters, but the way that Alan Moore developed them into characters that we actually care about um for this thing that's about to happen is is a hell of a way to end a chapter absolutely and all these characters are also loose ends that are being tied up by adrian yep so in addition to your everything you're seeing the plot also demands that none of these people know what happened so he's essentially the cover-up like the Everybody that wouldn't have knowledge of any piece of his plan is now dead. Mm-hmm. Everybody. So his mm-hmm. assistants, the people on the boat, the writers, the, the scientists, mm-hmm. um, you know, everybody's gone. All, even uh, e- even these low-level people that were like rigging locks that wouldn't lock. Yeah, and, it, uh, uh, no, no, you can't tie up loose ends. I mean, I'm sorry, you can't. You got to have <laughs> your loose ends tie up, you know, no matter what. No matter how little, no matter how, ins- you know, insignificant and everything, if it's a loose end, Ozymandias, he was perfect enough, or so we think, <laughs> to um, tie this all up. And like Scott was saying, I mean, it's a um, great way to end the, um, end the chapter. And the panels, excuse me, the panels, the way the um, disintegration happened um, goes back to the very first. We didn't see the first panel with the cover, you know, of, of, of what Scott was saying of the um, of drops um, clearing away the. What do we call that? The the um uh, the globe thing that you know the the greenhouse thing. The that, vivarium. Um, yeah, you vivarium. Yeah, yeah. Um, though the, it was clearing out, but as you see, the last panel here, well, the second to last panel, is the same thing, but in a shadow form. Right. You see that? Exactly. It, oh, it, that's it, so it, neat. It, it looks like a human figure, but 
it's actually the same. It's it's the last. <gasps> <laughs> it's the <laughs> brilliant, oh, that's right? So awesome, brilliant, right? Huh? And then the last panel is white. Nothing. Just white. My name is Ozzy Mandius, King of Kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. And then we get a night, an interview if you want to learn more about what's going on here at uh, Karnak. Mm-hmm. Uh, via the coda here is an interview. Um, and we see at the uh, the clock, mm-hmm. now reaching midnight, covered in blood. <sighs> that was a heartbreaking chapter, man. You know, even yeah. going back and talking about it and everything, and um, just realizing that, you know, in theory maybe adrian's right mm-hmm. but in execution he's horrible oh my god i mean I, and so i guess the 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 way comedian just looked at it i mean you know, he realized the plan realized how you know okay if if you got to sacrifice something to make the world work maybe and to make the world still exist and everything this is the ultimate sacrifice mm-hmm. you know um and still it's a joke you 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 compromise um uh you know stuff for the like the greater good and everything and mm-hmm. you know but still you know a life for a life you know for uh, what, what is the question i mean uh, you know uh to 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 sacrifice life for a bunch of lives i mean is is so, so it's it's sacrificing probably about 10 million lives i, I mm-hmm. mean half the population of new york area right mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's 10 million people because you think that if you don't do that then it will inevitably be resolved in the death of every every single person on, on Earth. Right. So it's this concept in philosophy. It's utilitarian, right? Mm-hmm. So what's the? It's based. It's basing morality on outcome. And Adrian says, you know, because these factors are inevitable, because it's inevitable that without you know, my intervention, nuclear war will happen. Mm-hmm. It is morally justifiable for these people to die because it's to prevent the death of a much larger number of people. Right. Um, this is it's a it's a philosophical experiment. That you'll hear described as the uh, streetcar experiment, right? <laughs> Have you ever heard of this? No, no. Okay, so I'll describe it for you real quick. So mm-hmm. there's a streetcar coming down the tracks, okay? And the, you are standing at a switch. Mm-hmm. And the streetcar is careening and will crash. And like it's going to fly off a cliff. Everyone on the streetcar will die. There's like 20 people on the streetcar. Right. Okay. You can throw a switch. And if you do that, the streetcar will change off the track and will not crash. However, it will kill one person who's standing on the tracks. Wow. So the question is, is it moral for you to pull the lever? Because at the very least, something or someone is going to die. So Someone is going to die. Mm-hmm. But by pulling the lever, you are choosing to kill one person. Right. Okay. Now your ju- your reasons in- are justifiable in a lot of ways, right? Right. Like, I, and that's kind of how we would view it. I think uh, we would say that's justifiable. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you know, it's a moral conundrum because you are directly responsible for the death of one person, and if you had not acted in that way, they would still live. Right. So you get blood on your hands, but is it the morally correct thing? And can those things be- are those things mutually exclusive? Right. So those are the big questions I think that that Ozymandias begs here. But mm-hmm. there is, of course. You know, there's, of course, a little slip to this, right? Mm -hmm. Which is, is he right? (laughs) Is he right that without his intercession here, nuclear war was inevitable? This conflict was inevitable. It could never be stopped. So the question is, since we know, because we have hindsight, right? Right. We know that in a world with no mass adventurers, nuclear apocalypse does not happen in the 1990s, right? (laughs) I mean, we we can be pretty sure on that one. We we got that benefit, right? Didn't miss that. Didn't mm-hmm. miss the nuclear holocaust, mm-hmm. uh, and, and I'm glad. I'm glad for it. <laughs> we so, be doing this podcast, <laughs> exactly right. We'd be, you know, trying to. We'd be marveling at a can of coke that we found in some hovel somewhere before we get eaten by a bunch of. Uh, anyway, so, <laughs> so, you know, uh, the question is, you know, is he right? Does Doctor Manhattan's presence make it inevitable that nuclear conflict would happen now, or is he wrong in that eventually, you know? mutually assured destruction would work like it worked in our timeline. We shall see next chapter. We shall. But remember, the the important question in morality here is, how sure are you that that was the case? Okay? Uh, Because if it's 10 of 10, then what he's doing is not 
impossible to justify morally. Mm -hmm. The more sure you are that that's the inevitable outcome, the more justifiable it is to, to undertake these methods. So the, the, the question that this makes you ask is, do the ends, what, what would I do if I needed, like, if I would lose everything if I didn't do something terrible? Right. Uh, everybody's heard of the movie series Saw. Mm-hmm. So this is a real Saw moment, right? <laughs> so to live, you have to dig into your own stomach to pull a key out so you can unthink. You know what I mean? That's, that's what he's doing here. You have to essentially and, hurt yourself, you know? Yes. Um, <laughs> um, for, like, the whole greater good and everything. And who's to say that even if this works... That mm-hmm. humans won't be humans, and um, everything just starts all over again. Well, Adrian solved the problem of the other here, and and, mm-hmm. and and I'm sure we'll talk about this a lot more next week when we yeah. sort of get into the effects of, of his action here and we find out how much it worked. Mm-hmm. But what he's what he's tried tempted to do because he's made this an alien attack, right? He's, mm-hmm. he's essentially, uh, you know, made it so the people of the world will feel that an alien race is going to attack them, right? Okay. And, and he has tapped into something in humanity, which is sometimes mm-hmm. we need to find another and we'll manufacture one if we don't have one. Yes. But an alien species enables you to draw the circle of us, right, around so, every single person in the world. Yep. Okay. It brings a because t- you, togetherness that wasn't there before, an element that, uh, unknown element that wasn't even considered, you mm-hmm. know, can actually bring everyone together and unite for a common a common fight cause. Exactly. And we need an us versus them. That's just what humans need, right? Yeah. Us versus them. And if there is no them, and we only have humanity, then them have mm. to be people. Yes. But yes. if there's another species, that, that can be them, and then us can be everybody. Yep. So yep. It, changes the, it changes the psychological outlook of humanity, and that's what he's trying to do. <laughs> Man, great chapter. Great wow. chapter. Great chapter. <clears throat> I mean, I mean, <laughs> I mean, how terrifying, right? Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, we'll we'll get into more of it, um, and see what the after you know the effects of the um the final chapter you know of all this and everything. So, um, um, so send us feedback. You know, yeah. watching Watchmen at NerdCyclopedia dot com. Of course, you know, subscribe to us. Give us um, you know, make sure you you give us a great rating on iTunes, or else you Scott will. <laughs> I reserve the right to give you the business. He sure. I will, have man. plenty of business to give out. By the way, <laughs> I've been saving it up. Um, um, follow us on um, um, Twitter and Facebook. You know, at our Sam and Scott are watching Watchmen. You know, at Nerd Cyclopedia, at Watchmen um, Podcast One, no T. Um, and you know, and and all the new ones that just came on and everything. We thank you for coming on, and all the ones yeah. that continue to listen to us and send us good feedback. We appreciate you as well. We, me and Scott, have love you know doing this and. You know, just can't wait to talk about more Watchmen. Watchmen is such a dope, is such a great concept um, mm-hmm. of deconstruction that um, you can hear it in our voices and a passion um, of, of how we're um, going through these chapters. And this was a really, really good chapter here. It's one of those ones that twist, you know, uh, it's mm-hmm. the twist you want to preserve. This is the one you want to keep secret, right? Yep. What is he doing? So it's so it's knowing that he's this is intentional and his, his aim is to end war. I mean, I'm telling you, this is this is the sort of thing where you can really understand what sets Watchmen apart. It's not just the rich and characters; it's that the plot itself is, is yes. terrifyingly complicated. And yes. and, 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 and uh, as uh, as Rorschach said in Chapter Ten, I cannot imagine a more dangerous adversary. And for that, you know, uh, we shall see you guys. That's we'll right. See you on the final chapter. Yes, come back so we can wrap this up. All right. All right. See you. Yeah, you never heard of that, uh, of the, the train switch experiment? The train switch. <laughs> never heard of that before? The train switch, the streetcar, no, I never heard of that. <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll exacerbate that a little bit, so they'll be like, oh, you throw the switch and a child dies, and they're like, ah, and they'll be like, well, what if it was your child? What if it, and then, you know, that's sort of, it's just a, a way to sort of illustrate the different, you know, like different ethical